You and Reb Shlomo are considered to be the two Zaydas of Jewish renewal, the Machatonises of Jewish renewal. And, um, and so that there's that, and, and he went a path that was narrow and yet very broad and very deep. And you went a path that went from sort of cosmic breakthrough to cosmic breakthrough to cosmic breakthrough. <laughs> And at the same time, you know, your cosmic breakthroughs were, um, were really grounded in community, always connected to Chev Rusa and Chevra. So would you talk a little bit about um, how you started with Reb Shlomo in the early days first? You know what? It's so wonderful. You ask me these questions, and now I'm sitting here like a pundit, you know, and I will say, this is what I did, and this is what I had in mind. I didn't know. I loved hanging out with him. He was alive, and some of the other people were just <laughs> carbon copies, you know. And so to, to, to meet with him and to hear what he was hoping, what he was longing for, and what, what I was hoping and longing for was just that. We both had the sense, you know, there's something about coming from Austria, uh, from Vienna, from Baden by Wien. Uh, it's a country where, where you had Mozart, and you had Beethoven, you had Freud, and you had Wittgenstein, you had all these, these people there. And there was an understanding that you can hold it all together like they did in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, that you had all these different nations, they were all under one uh, emperor, and it was wonderful. So that sense that you don't have boundaries um, that are decreed by the, the union to which you belong. So Lubavitches weren't supposed to go to the Babava, but Schleimer hung out with the Babava. He's the one who schlepped me to the Babava in the first place, you know. He told me about all kinds of other Rebbes, and that was wonderful to do. Then, uh, when the Rebbe had first told us to go to Brandeis, and uh, to, to go to colleges, and we decided Hanukkah to go to Brandeis. So here, uh, I brought along an old tape recorder with Hasidic music I'd played on a Hammond organ, and that was playing in one corner, and uh, Shlomo started to tell stories, and people gathered around him, uh, and then somebody says, that sounds like Hinduism or something like this. I pulled the guy away. That was my customer, you know? <laughs> so another one was saying something, this is evolution. What do you think about evolution? So I had my corner, he had his corner. He told the stories and I was doing the other stuff, okay? So, uh, but that time we gave out 13 pairs of film to people who put them on three times, took them off and tied them up. So once they had learned how to do it, we gave them to them, showed them how to use them. It was very much the outreach that had to do, both of us were involved in what we called restoration. We all knew how precious Europe was and that Yiddishkeit that was there, and we saw how far it was from here to there. And so we started to make beginnings to bring it back. When Shlomo was still studying at um, no, Rebaran Kotlis Yeshiva, and um, I asked him, what are you doing with those misnagdim? You know, I was sort of uh, more and more pulling him to come to and join us in Lubavitch. He said, who is going to be the London, you know? These people are going to die, and there's no one else to, to take their place. And he wanted, and Rebaran Kotler wanted to groom him to be, to be in his place because he had that wonderful, brilliant mind. Uh, and it, was, uh, and it was good, so we hung out, so we went to other places together. And I remember uh, visiting the rabbi who was in charge of Hillel at uh, Boston University. And I was saying to him, for this they get paid? <laughs> you know, we had to go and do this as voluntary uh, work. And these people had those jobs, and I was made up my mind, I'm going to be a Hillel director someday, and I did. So this is how it happened. He would come to Winnipeg later on, and the first time he sent me his recording. You see, before, he, had, he wasn't into guitar. He, was, uh, he had a little shul in New Jersey, and in that shul they had a piano, and he would sit and write his wonderful pieces. There's the, the, the most sophisticated music he did at the early beginning, this Mim Komach, 
which is a great co uh, composition. But the guitar does something else. First of all, you can't schlep a piano along. But when that first recording came, I just put it on and lit some incense and some candles, and I danced the whole record. You know, it was the, doing the waltz. He loved waltzes, and he loved marches, and, and between waltzes and marches, and, and basic major, and basic minor, that was his, his arena. And they were wonderful nigunim, and people were able to, to learn them, and the stories in which he told. <laughs> I would check out the books that he, uh, re, uh, from where the stories came, and then I would see how he told the story. And I try to understand what's the difference between the way in which he did it uh, and the way in which I um, uh, read it. And it got very clear to me that um, after he read the story, he played the movie in his mind. And then after he played the movie in his mind, he told the story, you know? So he didn't tell it from the book, he, play, he told it from the movie that, that he had seen in his mind. And so I learned a lot of stories from him that aren't just like there in the book, yeah? And that was wonderful. <laughs>